You know, I I watched something here a, a couple days ago. Now I guess it's been. It, it was a um, a sneak peek at a show that we'll talk about in a second, but it made me realize because the the subject of this particular program was like a lot of us when when we were all kids. You no, know, whatever time period that was or whatever era that was we you know when we were wrestling fans we were kids we wanted to wrestle with each other right we wanted to do what we saw on television that's how a lot of people got into business how did did you ever do that brian were you did you ever go through that phase or did you go straight to reading the wall street journal when you quit pissing the bed did i go to what phase the the phase where you wanted to do wrestling matches with your friends. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, there you go. Every year at the end of uh, summer, I would have a SummerSlam party for me and all my friends from summer camp, and it would always end in a giant battle royal on the front lawn. And truth, this is not a, a uh, phenomenon unique to kids that were wrestling fans, because remember, Jerry Jarrett didn't open Louisville up until 1970. I was uh, almost nine years old by the time that there was even wrestling again here in town. It took me a year or two to find it. But when we were in second grade, we had Batman fights. If you could get the teacher out of the room, right? Guys were taking bumps over the desk because Batman was on network TV and it was fucking hot. So it was the same thing, right? Did you have anyone there yelling like, pow, zap? Oh, you had to. <laughs> you had to kerplunk. <laughs> You know, and that's right. It, it, you know, it's, it's sound make vomit sounds. Woo -woo, and, you know, but so you were when you were a kid in some fashion, either from Batman on TV or from watching wrestling, you were working fights when you were kids, right? Not trying to hurt each other, but have it. And or if you on westerns, Wild Wild West, every western saloon fight ever on a TV show, same fucking thing. And so I guess what I'm asking, Brian, is just at the top of the program here, where the fuck did we go wrong? Where did society go wrong? Where did the, the human race go wrong? The, these innocent things that we used to do when we were kids, and most of the time if somebody got a bloody lip or a bumped in the nose or whatever the fuck, we didn't have a generation of teenage goofballs Growing up, either trying to have wrestling matches on trampolines so they could do flips, or actually beating the shit out of each other for real in, in, in order to somehow entertain each other and themselves. Where did we go wrong with this? It, it went from five Batman TV scenes and watching wrestling to... Well, we got to fucking have a barbed wire goddamn broom dildo uh, set up on a table on a scaffold in our backyard with a trampoline. I think it really changed when the first generation of people who watched wrestling videos started training, and then the next generation did. And as things kept changing overseas, people kept trying to do that stuff over here, whether it made sense or not, whether it worked or not. Next thing you know, you start having schools pop up with suspicious trainers, not necessarily like bad people, but the fuck does this guy know about a hip toss? <laughs> and then the more of that and the more we're training, you know, you used to hear stories and I'm not saying this is necessarily the right thing. Like I didn't take a bump for six months or whatever. You hear that kind of stuff. I'm not saying that's right, but I also don't think you should be teaching people to come off the top rope. Like within but, the first several months too. But like there's no, a, but you, but here's the thing. You're passing up my point in that the inclination wasn't there to do something that even had a probability, much less a certainty, of causing damage to yourself or the other person. I've talked about, yes, when I was a teenager, you know, yes, we're having matches. I had a mattress laid out in the floor of my room here at the castle. And then Mama Cornette said, Jimmy, there's a crack in the living room ceiling. Y'all got to quit that. And then we go over to my opponent's house, and he lived in an apartment over the fucking dry cleaners. So even we had a match on the weekend. They came in on Monday morning here with fucking plaster over all the clothes. <laughs> and then finally, we the, one of the kids that was 
affiliated over at the high school sports team as a trainer. They actually gave him a key to the fucking locker room and they had wrestling mats. So over a few shows, we had wrestling mats and they even had the wall padded up about three or four feet so you could use it as a turnbuckle. And But uh, the thing is, we weren't trying to imitate Mike Pappas. We didn't need a trampoline. I didn't have a trampoline, didn't know at the time when I was a teenager where the fuck a trampoline was, and nobody I knew knew where a trampoline was. But how could you have a wrestling match on a trampoline to stand and punch each other and complain to the referee that somebody pulled your hair? It would be too dodgy of a fucking footing. But at the same time, every, you know, you take a fucking body slam on somebody's living room floor or try to do a sunset flip or whatever. You only do one or two of those. It's not as fun as it was a minute ago. But finally, we get mats. We're still, again, everybody wanted to be the heel, but we wanted to be stars. We didn't want to be Mike Pappas. We wanted to be Jerry Lawler or Jimmy Valiant or Joe LaDuke. And how the fuck do they punch each other like that we know they can't be hitting each other as good as it looks and sounds like but we can't do it a couple times we tried is like oh jesus christ and a body slam was a big fucking deal because it's it's still it's fucking mats and we don't know what we're doing then if i got up on the fucking side thing to use as a turnbuckle i'll come off with the elbow the other guy's gonna move because of both of our common sense that I don't really know if I can do this, then I might cave your goddamn face in. And because the same, if I'd fucking come off on him, that he would want to come off on me, and I wasn't going to let that happen because he didn't know what the fuck he was doing either. But we were having, we were, hey, referee, pulled my fucking hair, right? The heel goes in the fucking tights for the foreign object, and boom, the headlock shot. We're having a fucking match like the stars do on television. And if, you know, and if there's six people in the crowd, because if there's six people involved in the wrestling, I think there was a few friends and a little sister. They're going, hey, referee's got something in his tights. I think there was a time where not just in your area, but in various places across the country. To play with your friends and be a wrestler, it was kind of more like Andy Kaufman being a heel. And it was probably as physical as him against the women. And that it's real, but no one's trying to kill each other. But then when things like, you know, for me and my friends, and again, I'm talking the late 80s, not even like at its peak in 83. But we all did the superfly splash into the pool. You know what I mean? Like that was the thing. Or get yeah. on the dresser and do the superfly splash onto the bed. I never in my life thought, I got to try a moonsault. And I never, yeah. <laughs> and I never would have done it in that situation where I'm wrestling with my friends. So I don't know if that answers any of your question, but I'm trying to think of examples that almost do. Well, but that's the the point is that now, not only do we have the trampoline cowboys. Remember they showed footage of Jungle Boy on AEW television when he was a kid training in some guy's backyard with the fucking ring next to the privacy fence. And but <laughs> we never there was not a ring. Again, anywhere around Louisville, Kentucky, set up within 75 miles in any direction, set up except for Tuesday nights from 5 o'clock till 10 o'clock at the Louisville Gardens, and it stayed at the gardens in the, in the basement. They, but you couldn't get in a real ring. But we had sense enough to know that not only do we not know how to do this shit and we don't have the equipment, but even if we got in a goddamn ring... We still, the first thing we wouldn't want to, would want to learn would not be, oh, let me jump off the top rope outside toward the concrete floor where some fucking knucklehead's going to maybe catch me. It's just insane. As, as the, <laughs> so I think that's, we've not only got guys practicing for a career in wrestling by how they can do flips on a trampoline, but then the only, attractive thing for them to learn about the business is shit that could probably end your fucking career before it starts if you're trying to do it to begin with unless you're properly trained and even then it's risky nobody wants to just learn how to what the stars do that draw money 
Uh, I think it's something to do with the mental state of current society. I'm not sure what. But again, though, I think if there was an open door policy to professional wrestling, even in the mid 80s, but certainly before then, you probably would have had more people doing things like that. Not necessarily a triple moonsault into the crowd or anything, but it would have been pushing boundaries past where the people who, like you said, are wrestling professionals are not only knowledgeable about how to make money, but knowledgeable about how to protect the business so that it can make money in the future. But now there's an open door policy. So when you have a flood of people getting into the business, who are the people that just want to do a moonsault off their roof? You're not necessarily getting as many of the, you know, WWE tries to get genuine athletes and draft them, but you know, that's a hit and miss thing, but you're not getting the same kind of people that got into the business sometimes for better, but often for worse now than you did then. I blame Heyman for the furniture. <laughs> okay. I think he has to bear the brunt. If I've got to take the blame for the fucking triple threat match, he's got to bear the brunt for the fucking furniture. When you say furniture, though, you're talking about like Sabu probably gets the blame or the credit for the table, right? Well, I'm talking about ECW's platform and influence on, the, you know, there's never been a situation where common, ordinary, decent furniture that was a, provided a service to the American <laughs> public was so abused and mistreated. Ordinary, decent furniture. Ordinary, decent furniture that had a long life of service to give and was recklessly destroyed by those angry wrestlers who were mad at that furniture. But anyway, that's just... Uh, <sighs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, again... I've been a wrestling fan, and I, I and like like I said, when I was a teenage kid, everybody still wanted to be the heel. If you were a teenage guy, nobody wanted to be the baby face. But yeah, we all wanted to be Ric Flair. We all wanted to do something just so we could strut and woo. Yeah, it wasn't because I wanted someone to chop me in the chest and flip me upside <laughs> down. <laughs> and there was still a little bit of self preservation instinct left in the in the brain of people at that point. All right, but anyway, the reason why I brought that up this has been happy talk. Well, it's a very happy, poss possibly even slappy. Um, the reason why I brought that up is because the debut of season four of Dark Side of the Ring is uh, it, almost upon us on Tuesday night, May 30th on Vice TV. Watch it while you can, folks. I hear there's a broke they can't pay attention. But it, it shouldn't reflect on our friends Evan and Jason because their <laughs> their hands are clean and all of that. Uh, but nevertheless, this season on Dark Side, the first episode is on Chris Candido and Tammy Sitch. And it, uh, the reason why I'm even promoting you watch this, because I think everybody's had enough of Tammy, to be quite honest with you. But this episode is Chris's story and Tammy's in it. Um, ah, shit. And if you want to see a. 46 minute program plus commercials where me, Lance Storm, Tom Pritchard, and Chris's brother Johnny all break down and cry and walk off. This is the, the program. Um, obviously, Tammy played a big part in it because she played a big part in his story, but it's from Chris's viewpoint and from a lot of his friends' impressions of him. And it, you know, he was a kid, he, when he was a teenager, when he was like 14, he was sneaking off with his friend to go, because now up, back then, up there in Jersey, in the Northeast, and in late 80s, there were guys with rings all over the place, and they were independent shows and all that type of thing, and he was under the radar, you know, bumping around in some of these rings when he was 15 years old or whatever, and then just, and he was, a kid that was fascinated by the business and wanted to be in it. It was his dream. So I just, I want to prep everybody. That's going to be the debut episode. And it's on Tuesday night, May the 30th on vice. And next week, we're going to try to have Evan Husty back on to talk about that one. And another episode this season is going to be on the Graham brothers. And we're going to talk about obviously Billy Graham here later on in the program. And the Graham families, uh, as as a whole, their basically involvement with and impact on 
uh, the McMahon family for a 50 something year period. Uh, but anyway, so that's, uh, we'll try to have Evan on next week to talk more about that, but that's what brought it up. But Chris, again, was another one of us who as a kid just loved wrestling, but he took it to new extremes and, and was driven to be not only part of it, but the best at it. And they did a real good job on, on the program. It's not Tammy's story. Tammy's in it is, is the best part of it. 